The parliament is the most visible and prominent institution of our democracy. It is the embodiment of the sovereignty of the people and the organ through which the supreme power is exercised. Although there are many references to people's representative assemblies in ancient times, the modern parliament has evolved gradually during the past hundred years in the course of the Indian freedom struggle, slowly with unfolding constitutional developments. The present parliament has inherited a lot from the Westminster system, the form of parliamentary government practiced in Great Britain. It is important to note though that India is a republic and a federal polity very different from Great Britain. Despite many outward similarities in its essence, the Indian parliament reflects Indian reality. The majestic circular building of Indian parliament is part of the complex that came up in the 1920s when the new imperial capital was being built. The architects, Lieutenants and Baker tried to blend the traditional Indian with the modern Western to come out with architectural designs rich in symbolism. The parliament is not merely a building of stone and mortar. The foundation stone was laid by the Duke of Connaught. It took many years and thousands of workers to raise the edifice that would become the seat of Indian democracy. And when the building was complete, it was inaugurated with great pomp and show. The Vice Regal House, now the Rashpati Bhavan, was perched at the highest point in the ridge, suggesting that it was built on the consecrated crest of sacred Mount Meru. It was flanked by the two pillars of the government, the bureaucracy and the armed forces, housed in the north and south blocks. A short distance away stood the Central Legislative Council, where hand-picked representatives of the people deliberated and advised the representative of the Crown. This building was the venue where the Chamber of Princes held its meetings. The design of this building was imposing and aesthetically pleasing. Inside, the halls are large with ample provision of light and air. The decorations are simple yet subtle, jutting balconies, the special vistas gallery and ornate windows with fine stone carved screens. Remind the visitor of places and opulent mansions in princely India. Like other structures in New Delhi, this too makes generous use of red sandstone from Dhalpur and the facade with large pillars recalls classical Greek and Roman assemblies. Due to a series of happy coincidences, the symbolism matches the ideals of Indian democracy. The same building houses the Lok Sabha and the Rajya Sabha. The central hall is used on ceremonial occasions and to hold joint sessions of the parliament. India is not simply emerging. India has emerged. In parliamentary democracy, parliament is supposed to be supreme as the representative of the people and the government is responsible to the people through the parliament which includes people's representatives. Representation in the parliament 
contributes crucially in bridging the geographical and emotional distance that separate Indians dwelling in a country that is in fact a subcontinent. From Andaman to Kashmir, from the deserts of Rajasthan to the green eastern India, all those who get elected and those who elect them share a sense of being masters of their own destiny and belonging to this great nation. Parliament is one of the major pillars of democracy. And if Parliament doesn't function properly, then the whole system gets unbalanced. Democracy has got to be nurtured. We are very proud of the fact that we've run a democracy for 60 years. It's a unique achievement. We are now growing economically also. But we mustn't allow the basis of democracy to be, uh, to be weakened. And that means we've got to strengthen the parliamentary system. We've got to accept parliamentary procedures. The composition of the parliament has changed dramatically since the years of independence. The first provisional parliament came into being when the Constituent Assembly transformed into the Parliament of India. This continued until the first elected parliament could be formed after the general elections in 1952. Many of the conventions and procedures were established during the sessions of the provisional parliament. A system, an institution rules on certain rules and regulations and that's how the house is conducted. And the responsibility of conducting the house is that of the presiding officer, the speaker, the chairman, the deputy speaker and the deputy chairman of Rajya Sabha. Speaker ke baare mein bhi yehi hai ki jab wo chun liye gaya hai, to wo dan se upar hoi. और मावलंकर जी से अब शुरू हुआ तो आप सब जानते हैं बड़े 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 विद्वान लोग स्पीकर हुए बड़े रिस्पेक्ट से भाव से काम करने की सभी ने कोशिश किया और ये भी मैं मानता हूं कि जो कुर्सी है वही आदमी को ट्रांसफॉर्म करता है जीवी मावलंकर वाज इलेक्टेड द प्रेसिडिंग ऑफिसर एंड वाज रीइलेक्टेड द स्पीकर ऑफ लोकसभा इन 1952 एएस अयंगार वाज इलेक्टेड हिज डिप्यूटी एंड सर्वड एज अ सेकंड स्पीकर ऑफ इंडियन पार्लियामेंट The speaker is the person who plays a pivotal role in conducting the proceedings, maintaining order and guarding the privileges of the house. The Indian parliament has been fortunate in having been led by men of such distinction. There are many others who assist him in this task. For instance, the Parliamentary Affairs Minister, the whips of the political parties, and others. जो सरकारी दल के मुख्य सचेतक होते हैं, वही संसदीय कार्यमंत्री होते हैं। इनका काम फ्लोर मैनेजमेंट है जाना जाए। अगर ये सही ढंग से फ्लोर मैनेजमेंट करेंगे, तो किसको लाभ हल्की में की होगा? अध्यक्ष को, स्पीकर को सदन चलाने में। सिर्फ स्पीकर की जवाब दे ही रूल्स के मुताबिक नियम के मुताबिक संविधान के मुताबिक चले वो तो देखना ही देखना है लेकिन उनके उनके सहयोग के लिए पूरे सदन के सदस्यों का और खास करके जो ये मुख्य सचेतक लोग हैं इनकी भूमिका है विधिवत जाना जाए ये जरूरी होता है मेंबर्स ऑफ द लोकसभा आर इलेक्टेड डायरेक्टली बाय द पीपल अब्दुल्ला सईद हैविंग बीन इलेक्टेड अ मेंबर ऑफ द हाउस ऑफ द पीपल do swear in the name of God that I will bear true faith and allegiance to the Constitution of India as by law established. Universal adult franchise ensures that those elected are truly representatives of the Indian people cutting across class, caste and community. The elections are supervised by the Election Commission of India a body autonomous and independent 
that ensures free and fair elections. General elections in India conducted by the Election Commission are believed to be the largest bureaucratic exercise in the world. Our parliament is a bicameral one. Lok Sabha is the directly elected lower house, while Rajya Sabha called the Council of States or the House of Elders is indirectly elected members. People don't understand that uh, sometimes that what is the role of Lok Sabha, how it functions and what is the role of Rajya Sabha. There are misunderstandings that uh, Lok Sabha is superior to Rajya Sabha, which is not true. These are the two wings of the parliament. Rajya Sabha means a Sabha belonging to the Raj. People otherwise think it is a Rajya Sabha when it's something belonging to the central state. No, no, no. Here Raj means the Raj is the terminology for the provinces. So it is a Sabha representing their interests. So first thing, there must be a, a clear uh, understanding that if there is any legislation which affects negatively the interests of the state from which you are coming, then you have a point to raise it and to oppose it or to get it modified. Secondly, if it impinges upon federalism, then you can again intervene into it. Nehru was committed to parliamentary democracy and exerted all his life to lay strong foundations for the success of Indian parliament. Even as prime minister, he accorded highest priority to proceedings in the house. He seldom missed a sitting and took active part in the question hour and in various debates. He encouraged dissent and accepted gracefully a genuine difference of opinion. All he insisted upon was that members should conduct themselves with dignity and respect to the rulings from the chair. He severely admonished members of his own party when they seemed to transgress from the prescribed code. He treated the most bitter of his opponents, some of them his erstwhile colleagues. Like Acharya J.B. Kriplani, Meenu Masani and Dr. Ram Manohar Lohia with utmost courtesy and grace. No one can deny Nehru the credit that is due to him for establishing healthy conventions in the house. In six decades and more, the Indian parliament has provided the platform for some of the most inspiring and historic speeches. Enactment of a bill or its failure to pass muster has often hinged on their powerful oratory. Years later, their memory remains green and even ideological opponents concede their greatness as a parliamentarian. Uh, my hero in parliament for the last 20 years that I've been in and out of parliament is Atal Bihari Vajpayee. And this, mind you, I'm saying as somebody who didn't know very much Hindi, had a little bit of Urdu picked up in Pakistan. I just sit there fascinated listening to this man who had an incredible ability to build up his argument, keep people in good humor, to use rapier wit rather than the stiletto 
in order to get at his opponents and yet rise to very high heights of oratory, uh, almost at will, almost as in when he wished. I think he is the greatest parliamentarian that I have encountered uh, in my 20 years in parliament. The Indian constitution follows the principle of separation of powers between the three branches of governance, the legislature, judiciary and the executive. There have been occasions when a passing conflict has risen due to contending claims regarding jurisdiction and privilege. This is the only country which reconciles the institutions of governance with federalism. Hence, it was not only separation of power, it was also division of powers and responsibilities and jurisdictional division. Although the actual experience has been that the Indian Republic has functioned more as a unitary state than a federal polity. The phrase separation of powers in the true sense in which it was meant by the inventor of the phrase, the Frenchman Montesquieu, has never been prevalent in India. It's a misconception, it's not been there in England, it's not there in India, because we have a hyphenated legislature and executive. The executive cabinet is a subset of the legislature. True separation of powers exists only in the US or partly in other countries which have a system similar to the US. The judiciary has always been a separation of power because without separation of power there, you will have no independence. And independence and objectivity of adjudication requires the judiciary is totally separate. India is a plural society that displays great diversity in its politics. This is reflected in the large number of political parties of different hue that send their representatives to the parliament. During the national movement, leaders professing different ideologies were united in the anti-colonial struggle. And the Indian National Congress, guided by Mahatma Gandhi, acted as a large umbrella under which people of different political hue could stand. Soon after independence, the inevitable process of splintering started. The communists gave a call for revolution and embarked on a separate path. The socialists, too, distanced themselves from the Congress and the Nehru government. They felt that Nehru's commitment to socialism was no longer credible as his cabinet included powerful leaders with reactionary status quo views. On the other hand, there was a substantial segment of political leadership that felt threatened by the revolutionary fervor of the young socialist Turks within the Congress party. They formed a separate group that spawned the Swatantra party led by Chakravarti Raja Gopalachari. Most of its members belong to the class of landlords, princely families and capitalists. The Hindu religious sentiment was articulated by the Hindu Mahasabha and the Jansang. In addition, there were smaller groups like the Akali Dal and Muslim League giving voice to religious minorities. With the passage of years, regional political parties emerged claiming to be the guardians of the interests of the people with a distinct cultural identity and presented themselves as champions of federalism. There was a, I think, a watershed in our evolution of political history in 1991. From 1991, we have had institutionalized coalition governance. Prior to that, you may have aberrations like the 77 situation or even the 89. And coalition governance sometimes can work very well because it involves regional aspirations being expressed. So it allows regional concerns to come up like a pressure valve, like a pressure cooker. It allows it to be taken care of at the regional level and doesn't involve a necessary explosion at the central level. 
the essence of parliamentary democracy lies more in intangible and personal elements and not so much in the text of the constitution. The spirit of the constitution manifests in the members who occupy it and bring it alive. The vibrancy of the Indian democracy is palpable when members belonging to different political persuasions contend in the house. From the beginning till today, elected representatives of the people have debated complex issues, made stirring speeches and enacted historic legislations. These are truly hallowed precincts. In the early years, the Indian parliament was particularly fortunate to have among the members some of the most powerful orators in the land. The Prime Minister and the leader of the house, Jawaharlal Nehru was an exceptionally eloquent speaker. The government had other leaders like Rafi Ahmed Kidwai, Vijay Lakshmi Pandit and Maulana Azad to support them. The talent on the opposition benches was no less impressive. Hiren Mukherjee was tireless and brilliant in cornering the government. Meenu Masani had razor-sharp intellect and sparkling wit that made him a star. Acharya J.B. Kriplani of the Socialist Party and A.K. Gopalan among the communists cast a spell on the listeners and kept the government on its toes. Many of these eminent parliamentarians continued to serve the nation for almost two decades. Some like Professor N.G. Ranga, the member of the Constituent Assembly, remained active in Parliament as late as 9th Lok Sabha. The quality of debate in this Rajya Sabha is exactly as good as was the quality of debate in the Lok Sabha when I came in in the 10th session. I was a backbencher. My number was, I think, 75. I was near the pillars at the back of the hall. And because I was frequently deployed by the Congress then as a kind of principal spokesman on many controversial issues, whom did I have to contend with? Atal Bihari Vajpayee, followed by Somnath Chatterjee, followed by, um, uh, followed by Indrajit Gupta, followed by um, Chandrasekhar. There was no end of, uh, followed by George Fernandez. There was no end of debating talent on the opposition benches. In recent years, the proceedings in the House are directly telecast. This has led to a heated debate about the impact of this coverage on the events in the House. We went by the rules of the House. We have never raised the question, I have never raised one objection beyond the rules of the procedure. Only with the book, the rules book and other things you used to do. Same thing I want the present uh, opposition also because one day you are going to become the government also. That if you shout and uh, does not have anything, the same thing will be repeated to you. The decision to telecast the proceedings of the House live was taken to let the people know what their elected representatives were doing to further their interests. One thing that I would like to say is, earlier, media used to cover parliament much better than it does now. If um, uh, Shama Prashad Mukherjee or Acharya J.B. Karpalani or, for that matter, Radhanath Kunju or Kamath, if any one of them made a good speech in parliament, it would be reported. Now, howsoever good a speech may be, it is in the category of uh, dog bites men. It makes no news. But if a member tears off his shirt on the floor of the house, lies down on the floor of the house, disrupts the proceedings of the house, shouts, uses abusive language, that is given front page. The debate continues and there is no general agreement. It is important to note that though in the beginning our forefathers had borrowed heavily from the Westminster model, it was never their intention to mindlessly ape or mimic the British system. If you look at the Constituent Assembly debates, 
and the debates, the great debates of uh, the 19, 1950s. There are people who are contending against very strongly, against a strong Westminster kind of structure again in India. Now they are saying, look here, we have our own traditions and the Westminster kind of a model is not applicable to India. Uh, while elements of it might be appropriate, eventually we need to create institutions which are suitable to this country and to this soil. The composition of the house continues to display all the colors of the rainbow till date. A set of effective laws is required. Laws that address the following critical issues are necessary. The composition of the parliament both in Lok Sabha and Rajya Sabha has changed dramatically in recent years. The profile of the members in terms of age, profession and educational qualifications has changed with passage of time. An equally important change can be witnessed due to the breakdown of the single party dominance. In the era of coalition governments, many of the traditions and conventions are under stress. The shrill voice and what may at times appear as unruly behavior of the members in the house should not cause unnecessary distress. It is the impatient articulation of the aspirations of a people who have waited perhaps too long to get their due. What the Indian parliamentary system has succeeded in is to realize the dream of Gurudev Ravindranath Tagore, an inspiration to generations of Indian freedom fighters who had prayed for independent India to be a land where the head is held high and the mind is without fear. <laughs>